Okay. Uh, yes, I think we are live. Uh, we are live now. Uh, okay. So let's start uh, uh, today. Uh, we are very excited to have Dr. McKee from uh, University Health Network, University of Toronto, uh, a star uh, preclinical image facility, and uh, the founder of uh, Patio Mix uh, Company. So uh, before that, I'll go through some housekeeping notes uh, as usual. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we usually record uh, these talks, and uh, and uh, if uh, I mean you want a refresher or you've missed it, you can watch it later on. And uh, if you have any question, uh, there is a Q&A box on the on the platform uh, on the bottom of uh, the the video. So please ask your questions there, and then. Uh, and uh, there is a poll box. Uh, please take uh, the poll uh, to help us improve the, the quality of these uh, inserts. Uh, by that, uh, for, for next week, um, we have Dr. Adam uh, Feinberg from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, and uh, he's also the CTO and co-founder of Floyd Form. And uh, he's talking about the, the technology, uh, fresh 3D uh, bioprinting, uh, uh, next next Wednesday at uh, noon uh, Eastern time. And uh, as always, you can uh, get the most updated information about uh, our e-seminar from our Twitter channel, LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, you can contact uh, me and Mohsen and uh, our coordinator, Rahid. And uh, uh, I would like uh, to, to also thank our sponsor, Transmetic Institute, uh, Transmetic Institute uh, aims to support the development of innovative medical technologies, train the next generation of professionals, and make innovation in life sciences and engineering. Based on a living lab approach, Transmetic provides an integrated environment that supports interdisciplinary uh, collaborative processes and co-creation of new, uh, new medical technologies and intervention to catalyze their development and adoption by users. And uh, our, uh, the, the, the sponsor of this talk is the Stem Cell Technologies. Uh, the Stem Cell Technology is a global biotechnology company that develop, uh, develops, manufactures, and sells products and provides services that support academic and industrial scientists. Uh, the company specializes in developing cell culture media, cell separation products, instruments, and other reagents for use in a stem cell immunology, cancer, regenerative medicine, and cellular therapy research. So they have the head headquarters in Vancouver, but uh, they have other uh, uh, offices in around the world, including UK, Germany, France, Australia, US, Singapore, and China. And uh, so, uh, uh, this company is, uh, is the largest biotechnology company in Canada, and uh, they have 1,500 uh, employees. Uh, and uh, their catalog of the, their product is 2,200 products. So I think we lost Travis, uh, but uh, I'll try to uh, introduce him. So I have to invite him and... Okay, so uh, just uh, just make sure that Trevor is with us, and then I'll introduce him. Uh, Hi. Um, hello. <laughs> my my now now my my internet router is not cooperating. Sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> so uh, uh, I wanted to just introduce Dr. McKee. Uh, Dr. McKee. Uh, Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, uh, he's the senior data scientist at the STAR uh, Preclinical uh, pre uh, pre Imaging Facility with the, uh, within University Health Network at the University of Toronto in Toronto. And he has been developing novel techniques for the acquisition and analysis of microscopy and medical image data for 20 years since his PhD at MIT. For the past 10 years, Dr. McKee has has led the computational pathology efforts at the STAR core facility uh, to develop new workflows for high throughput semi uh, automated analysis in order to perform tissue cytometry, uh, extracting quantitative special, uh, special as well as biomarker information from tissue section. 
He has expertise in performing multi-modality uh, correlations of information from medical imaging and uh, clinical radiology with several tissue-based optical and mass spectrometric uh, techniques, including imaging mass cytometry, uh, for which he, uh, he has been developing analytical methods for the past five years. He has published more than uh, 40 uh, publications utilizing these analysis pipelines and works at the forefront of the application of advanced technologies and integration with uh, pathologist workflows to help extract single cell uh, proteomics inside and quantitative data from uh, pathological slides and 3D imaging. By that, uh, it's, uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, Dr. McKee with us. Uh, so uh, the virtual floor is yours, uh, Dr. McKee. You can share your screen and uh, Great. Um, can I'm just sharing now. Here we go. I realized that um, I might not see uh, you guys when oh, I'm yeah. presenting. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The platform you can see us uh, during your presentation. Once once you you stop your presenting uh, during Q and A, you can see us. So okay. but we see, we see you and the, the the participant will see you. Okay. Sounds great. Just uh, yell if anything um, looks uh, untoward. But hopefully everyone can see my title slide. Yeah. Perfect. So um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present, uh, Mojin and um, uh, Human. This is a really great uh, opportunity. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I thought I'd give just sort of a you know biomedical engineer's journey through entrepreneurship and biotechnology, um, focusing on sort of mostly focusing on imaging and image algorithms. So um, I, I won't go over, belabor the point, but um, yes, I have been an image analysis core manager for several years at the University Health Network um, in, in the STAR facility. Um, in addition, I've actually um, uh, co-founded a, a startup company called AI Valley. Um, uh, we co-founded in about 2017, and I was um, with them until 2020, where we sort of decided to, to break apart the two um, directions that we were, we were going in. and. Um, uh, uh, and then I continued with sort of some ideas that I'll discuss um, later on around um, uh, pathomics and computational pathology um, uh, as an online service. So um, again, my background um, in 2000, uh, a number of years ago, got a PhD in biological engineering from MIT, um, uh, where thankfully I, I worked in drug delivery and cancer, and thankfully some of the ideas that I worked on are actually now in clinical trials. Um, for improving drug delivery in cancer and pancreatic cancer. Um, uh, I'm also, I, I call myself an entrepreneur, uh, I, I, sort of a co-founder of the uh, Image Analysis Core facility as, uh, as a part of the STAR Image Analysis facility. Um, there, um, I, I help to sort of generate revenue and keep the, keep the core going um, through working with, um, working both with academic clients as well as with a number of uh, pharma and external uh, clients and granting agencies. Um, I'm also a steering committee member with um, the Princess Margaret Radio Radiomics um, AI Machine Learning Group at UHN. Um, as I mentioned, um, we uh, co-founded a, a startup uh, where we went through a number of different incubators um, and uh, try to get some initial contracts. And um, I'll talk a bit more about pathomics and sort of a new idea around open source innovation. Um, and then finally, in addition to all of these hats, I've had worn a few other hats over the years. Uh, I'm an adjunct lecturer um, with the Laboratory of Medicine and Pathobiology at Toronto, uh, also a new member of the Temerity Center for AI Research and Education in Medicine, uh, where my focus is on AI and machine learning applied to pathology. Um, and then I've also founded a number of, you know, uh, student groups over the years, including a biomedical engineering society, University of Buffalo, my undergrad institution. I worked on the grad student council at MIT. Um, and then I've helped to found the Toronto Postdoctoral Association, um, as well as I'm the current president of the MIT Alumni Club of Toronto. Um, so uh, keep, keep myself busy. So um, a, a few topics I'll be discussing, um, sort of a, a brief intro on, you know, my thoughts on engineering in innovation and entrepreneurship, um, then go into what we do at STAR, a general overview of uh, image analysis pipelines, and then some challenges and future opportunities for multiplex segmentation and analysis. So um, you can think of engineering innovation and entrepreneurship um, sort of in very similar ways. Uh, with engineering innovation, you're really focusing on problem solving. 
looking at what fundamental principles underlie whatever system you're studying, um, what technologies can be applied to generate a solution to that problem, and then uh, how will that solution that you've come up with, you know, maybe in a laboratory, um, behave in the real world. So um, it's really more about a mindset, right? You're not creating, you want to create new and not just use existing products that are out there. Uh, entrepreneurship is, is very much very similar right you're, you're trying to solve a problem that exists in the marketplace um, you know, that includes um, trying to find a market that exists for that proposed solution um, and then how can you effectively execute on um, you know capturing that market in order to um, have a successful business um, uh, a big part of that is how do you pitch a solution so that it will sell um, and again, it's a mindset, you know, you can apply entrepreneurial thinking to creating a company. You could also apply it to maybe, you know, coming up with a new grant idea for your, um, uh, for your research. So it really is, um, you know, um, applicable over a large uh, number of different uh, areas. So, um, you know, and, and I've always been drawn to biomedical engineering even before, I mean, I did my undergrad in chemical engineering. Um, because there wasn't a biomed biomedical engineering department, but um, I took a biological minor at the same time. Um, and I've really been drawn to how we can, you know, and use um, engineering principles in combination with all of the knowledge in biological sciences, in combination with really the problems that come from the medical field um, to try and, uh, you know, innovate. So um, this is one example from my PhD days where we built a new type of multi-photon microscope um, use that to kind of understand better about the um, penetration of um, viral particles into tumors and then use, use that information to come up with better treatments for um, using oncolytic viruses to um, better penetrate into, uh, into cancer. So um, uh, one of the big um, uh, challenges that exists in the market is um, drug development. So um, uh, many people might recognize this. This is Moore's law. The number of transistors on a chip doubles um, exponentially. Um, in, in drug development, um, it's Moore's law backwards, EROM's law. So the number of drugs approved per billion dollars of US spending follows an inverse exponential. And we passed a billion dollars somewhere around the year 2000. So it's becoming more and more expensive um, to generate drugs. Um, this is in part because um, the drug development pipeline is very leaky. So for every 10,000 you know, candidate drugs that might come into a certain uh, screening protocol, you might get end up with one FDA approved drug at the end of it. So um, um, one of the things I've really been interested in is imaging and how can we use um, preclinical imaging to potentially enhance um, the drug development pipeline. Um, you could think of doing this both by um, having better preclinical models um, as well as potentially um, during the course of clinical trials um, coming up with better companion diagnostics and biomarkers that could help um, you know, uh, look at a biopsy and be able to say whether um, this patient would benefit from this drug or not. So um, this is particularly important in the in the area of um, tumor immunotherapy. So um, uh, uh, you know, using the patient's immune system to attack cancer, um, really, um, we need to know ahead of time. Um, you know, how much of the immune system is already in that patient's cancer because um, uh, tumors exist along a spectrum all the way from, you know, already inflamed to um, sort of an immune desert where there's no immune, there's no immune markers present. Um, and this is a challenging thing because um, there are actually multiple biomarkers for each of the cell types that reside in the tumor. In the tumor marker environment, you're going to have um, dendritic cells, T cells, macrophages, um, tumor cells, and they're all have a growing number of um, markers associated with them. Some of them, some of which, when you block them, have been shown to be quite effective for um, inducing um, uh, anti-tumor immunity. Um, and uh, really, basic immunology research is key to finding out about these targets. So, as so much so that I was said by that fundamental knowledge of biology is what's actually driving the pharmaceutical industry nowadays uh, to find more and more of these, you know, reg key regulatory um, uh, uh, markers. So um, another reason why I think image, Im imaging uh, is important is, um, you know, uh, if you think back historically to how we've 
done um, uh, cancer research. Um, you might grow a tumor in immunodeficient mouse. Um, you treat that tumor as mostly a black box. You might measure, you know, just size over time or something like that, um, and maybe drug concentration when you take the tumor out. But um, there are very few endpoints that don't really tell you a lot about what's going on within the biology of that tumor. However, with um, the advent of, of new types of uh, imaging methods, both in vivo imaging as well as ex vivo um, on tissue sections, um, we can get a lot more information out of any one of these um, cancer models. And so that can tell us a lot more about drug distribution, um, you know, drug resistance, a number of different factors uh, within that. And, and key to that is, is, of course, the quantification of that. So um, along these lines, the um, STAR In Innovation Center um, was um, formed um, uh, some, somewhere around 2007. Uh, it's a preclinical multimodality imaging core at the Princess Mark Cancer Center where we um, uh, provide a service to anyone that needs, um, needs to uh, assess um, either the effects of radiation or drugs on um, cancer models and a growing number of other models. And um, we really try to provide an end-to-end -end service all the way from designing your experiments through performing them, um, doing the analysis on them, and then of course the ultimate goal is translating those findings um, to the clinic. So uh, as just as one example, we have a number of uh, uh, housing facilities where we can um, um, bring uh, uh, models through to do um, precise radiotherapy along with imaging, whether it's PET, CT, or MRI. Um, we then have a full service pathology suite on site where we can take the tissues out and then we can do um, uh, a number of different um, uh, approaches to looking at um, tissue sections anywhere from bright field and immunofluorescence through autoradiography, through um, imaging mass cytometry and um, Desi, a number of different methods. Um, my job is here to kind of bring all of that data together, um, uh, fuse it together, and try to help to generate publications and results that can go back to clients. Um, and along with that, we have a large um, uh, amount of data storage, as well as standard operating procedures and core operator support to be able to use all these different uh, uh, equipment. And why do we need so much equipment? Well, um, uh, one of the reasons is that um, each one kind of gives you a certain window into what's happening in, in the biology. So um, whereas something like um, CT imaging might be quite, um, uh, might be uh, uh, able to give you relatively high resolution, it's relatively insensitive to um, uh, the concentration of um, uh, contrast agent that you inject. So meaning that you need to inject a whole lot of concentration of uh, agent just to be able to see something like blood flow um, within your um, tissue. Whereas um, a positron emission tomography is a lot more sensitive to um, very small trace amounts of, uh, of uh, uh, things that you inject into the uh, model, but um, uh, but it also, also suffers from less spatial resolution um, than CT. And um, all of the um, pathological um, things that I'm probably going to focus on for today's talk, um, you know, you can get very high resolution when you take a tissue section out of a tumor, but um, uh, they they also suffer, they also have a range of sensitivities uh, and specificities for um, uh, both either bright field immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence, or imaging mass cytometry. So, um, so the star. Uh, because uh, this was a challenge, um, what we found what we found when we were working when I was working in this facility was that actually analysis was a bottleneck um, to the uh, work that you could do. It was a lot easier to sort of generate an image um, than it was to necessarily get the information out of that image. So um, uh, because of that, I founded um, this image analysis core. It's kind of grown over the years. Um, we've grown it sort of organically through a fee for service analysis approach where we um, we perform work for academic or clinical research clients, um, and we've also increasingly reached out to pharma clients to um, to help uh, supplement income. And um, uh, during the course of this work, we've sort of built up our own internal data sets, know-how, and algorithms, um, including uh, working under GCLP documentation for pharma clients, and, as well as building our own tools for machine and deep learning that I'll discuss a bit. And um, and we've been able to be you know relatively successful in terms of uh, productive uh, both research and financial. So um, uh, I, I said three staff. We actually just lost Fred 
um, Fred has left us for, uh, uh, he was a very talented programmer who was working with us. And um, I say left us for the dark side of the financial industry, um, but uh, we are getting ready to hire a new programmer. So, you know, potentially your name here in terms of the uh, uh, growing our core again. And then uh, what sorts of works do we do? Work do we do? Well, um, uh, one of the things we do, of course, um, our, our core is to um, help academics with clinical investigator initiated trials. Um, there, there's a lot of focus on integration with experiments, right? If you're doing a uh, image, mouse imaging experiment in STAR, um, we really, uh, we can help to tailor the analysis to um, the questions that are being asked in that experiment um, and very much uh, looking at high precision and trying to develop new and advanced analyt analytics that can eventually go into publications. Um, as I mentioned, we've also um, done a growing a number of uh, work with um, both pharmas and CROs, where we provide analysis as a service to these pharma clients, um, where there the focus is actually a lot more on reliable out outputs, robust validation, and fast turnaround. So um, we need to you know, make sure that we're documenting everything that we're doing with um, standard operating procedures and um, good clinical laboratory practices, um, as well as you know, making sure that um, you know, we can we can measure a difference, let's say, from a control tissue to a treated tissue. So um, now diving into the details of what exactly we do. Well, um, a lot of what we do is actually um, uh, using software that's been borrowed from um, satellite imagery. Um, that's where, um, you know, you might receive an image like this. And what you would do is to um, group similar pixels together into super pixels. Um, then start to classify those pixels um, in order to identify your roads from your buildings, from your trees, from your cars, et cetera. Um, so once uh, that's done, that allows you to, um, uh, you know, be able to, to get more information out of these images. Um, so with tissue cartography, we're really doing the same thing. We are um, uh, analyzing uh, tissue uh, with respect to its neighbors, where we would um, identify similar pixels, maybe pixels that correspond to um, uh, uh, the nuclei of cells, and then we can grow from those nuclei to simulate a cytoplasm and a membrane, and then we can measure um, the intensities and shapes and distances um, within that context. So um, we've done this now on a number of different uh, tissues where we really try to um, uh, approach this in kind of a hierarchical framework where you first start by identifying the, the tissue within the slide, then you identify the individual cells within the tissue and then potentially subcellular regions like maybe spots within nuclei or um, other things like that. Um, and the goal, of course, is, is to work closely with pathologists to make sure that what we're doing is accurate, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, potentially develop new algorithms within this context. And um, there's a number of um, references I'm happy to point people to. So um, uh, if you think about um, pathology um, in general, um, uh, it falls into kind of three broad categories. The first one is immunohistochemistry. So um, that's where um, you would use, um, that's where we would use uh, uh, bright field stains. Um, and uh, the advantage is it's very uh, routinely uh, used uh, in the clinic um, and it's very reproducible, um, but it's generally only one marker at a time. Um, and so what you, what you can do is you can start to identify individual cells um, within this tissue and then uh, use the threshold to identify how many of them are brown versus not. Um, and uh, we've uh, adapted, we've sort of generated a generalized um, analysis pipeline that we um, tend to use for analyzing these sorts of images. Um, that's where we might get a number of individual single marker um, sections together. Um, what we can do is we can actually start to, um, if we have a number of serial sections, um, uh, we can uh, build a virtual multiplex. So that's where um, we can combine the brown stains from each individual section into a combined image. This is work we did um, uh, as, as part of a service contract with HistoWiz, which is online online um, uh, service slide pathology service. And um, that allows us to be able to um, you know, look at um, at least similar regions. It's not necessarily the same cell on all of those sections, of course, but um, similar regions and look at the, the preponderance of these markers within different regions. Um, following that, you can do stain separation and cell segmentation. That's where um, stain separation is when you take a blue and brown stain and separate it into the individual components. 
Uh, and then cell segmentation is where you could then identify the individual cells um, in, in those tissues. Um, following that, there's a number of different classification strategies you can employ. Um, and then finally, um, the, the important uh, thing at the end is to get numbers and quantitative readouts. Um, however, uh, one of the things we've noticed over time is that um, really what's critical to success is a robust um, quality control and validation strategy. So, um, you know, uh, the errors in any one of these steps can sort of propagate down to the subsequent steps um, and that can, you know, uh, degrade the uh, reliability of the results you get out at the end. So um, uh, we've, we've uh, done a bit of work that I'll, I'll discuss shortly about um, QC. So one of the things, uh, the challenges is, of course, uh, machine learning can actually make mistakes. Uh, machine learning is only as good as the training data you provide it. So um, this was one example of that where um, we had a lung whole tissue um, taken out of a, a lung of a transgenic animal that had um, uh, tumors spontaneously growing within it. Um, and our, our software after training identified the tumor as being in this orange region. However, um, when we looked more closely, we saw that actually a lot of this wasn't tumor, but it was um, bleeding around the surface of that tumor. So um, we had to actually, uh, there was a diligent grad student that went in and very carefully kind of edited out all of the um, incorrect data um, to result in a you know tumor volume um, estimation that was a lot more accurate. Um, uh, we've, we've sort of applied this to other things. So um, this is a, an example of uh, uh, looking at a brown stain for proliferation within um, TMAs from breast cancer. And um, this is uh, work done in um, Dr. Susan Doan's lab where um, um, Dr. Doan is a pathologist and she had a pathology fellow um, count a number of these brown cells within this tissue. Um, and then we could develop a, um, a machine learning algorithm that, that could do a reasonable job of matching the manual counts um, that were uh, being performed within the tissue, certainly a lot better than uh, kind of more basic um, positive pixel type uh, analyses that, that were done. Um, finally, uh, we've, we've translated some of this to at least a clinical trial uh, uh, monitoring um, uh, environment where um, we are looking at a number of different biomarkers over the course of time uh, where we can um, look at individual, um, we can actually develop deep learning algorithms that can separate um, dif distinct compartments of the tissue. And then um, we're counting the brown cells that are present within these um, individual markers. Um, and uh, what we've tried to develop is actually a validation strategy that um, where we, when we compare the automated counts to the manual counts, um, to some manual spot checks that we do, um, we try to ensure that the, you know, the, the um, we tune the algorithm such that um, we could get um, between 80 and 120 percent of the manual counts um, within these tissues. And, um, and you can see that we've done fairly well, although with very, very crowded um, uh, cells where there's many, many cells in one particular region, um, we do have a slight tendency towards um, slightly overcounting um, the number of uh, cells that are present. And this is uh, work that's resulted in a recent publication. Uh, finally, uh, and uh, last thing to talk about in the bright field is um, we can actually use AI methods to improve a cell counting workflow. Um, so uh, one thing that's very important in myeloma is um, the detection of plasma cells, which are these brown ringed cells um, within, uh, within bone marrow biopsies. And um, the clinical problem is that um, there's, a, there's a count cutoff for um, discrimination of, um, of one type of disease from another. Um, and so rapid and accurate counting would be very helpful as a sort of pathologist decision support tools. Um, however, um, when we try to look at, again, manual versus um, predicted counts, um, when we just use something like a positive pixel count, you can see that really there's very poor um, correlation in both uh, the number of brown cells that are counted versus what are actually there, or even the, the blue cells. Um, uh, with, cell, with cellular segmentation techniques, um, this does improve slightly, um, but there's still a wide variation. You know, ideally you'd want these slides to be, these, um, uh, these uh, curves to go right along the, uh, the line of unity. Um, so what we did was to train a convolutional neural network um, that was trained on pathologist annotations. 
um, and uh, where there's a number of pathologists that would annotate um, both the negative and the positive cells within these regions. Uh, and then uh, what you can see is that um, whereas the kind of the uh, cellular segmentation tool, um, you know, did maybe a reasonable job of uh, counting the brown cells, but not so much the blue cells. When we go to a deep learning um, approach, um, we can really train uh, quite a reliable network that can detect um, both the brown cells and the blue cells accurately. And because the, um, the because what's important here is actually the ratio of brown to blue cells, um, that means that the um, resulting uh, performance metrics are doing quite well. And in fact, um, we're, we're um, we're approaching the um, agreements between two separate pathologists that annotated the same um, area. So it's really an indication that, you know, we're, we're doing quite well in terms of, um, you know, the, the deep learning approach um, does well in counting these cells. So um, uh, next steps for this work is to actually um, try and see if we can get this um, available to more pathologists to, to um, uh, check out. So we've um, uh, developed a server application where pathologists can take a picture on their microscope mounted camera and send it to the server and the server would respond and, and kind of say, this is where I've found those brown and blue cells to be. Um, and um, the, the goal of course is to kind of um, pass it through several rounds of review and try to see what are the next steps for implementation of this uh, type of uh, work in a hospital setting. Uh, finally, um, one thing that's quite interesting is um, that there's a lot of spatial information embedded in a pathology image. Um, and so this has actually been known for some time. So um, there was a paper in 1955 um, that had a very el elegant analysis of um, the histological structure of tissues and how they relate to, um, in this case, radiotherapy. Um, and what they found was that there's kind of this um, distinct uh, uh, distance um, that happens in these tissues. Uh, and they actually use this, um, this tool called a planimeter that um, measures the curve of a certain uh, uh, tissue. And, um, and what they found is that, um, you know, most of the uh, viable tissue cells um, live within a certain distance away from a blood vessel. And when you get far enough away from that, um, you exit from the viable tissue and go into a region known as necrosis or dead tissue. Um, so uh, what we did was actually, we, we, we um, found that we could um, uh, take these images right out of this 1955 PDF online, um, and we could see, well, what if we tried to do a similar approach? So we um, classified the image into either um, stroma, tumor, or necrosis using a machine learning algorithm. Um, and then we measured the distance um, away from the stroma present within the tissue. And when you do that, you can see that you can um, map out um, that as you get, again, as you get beyond about 150 microns away from uh, blood vessels, um, you tend to have mostly necrosis and very little tumor. Uh, and, um, you know, Dr. Tomlinson and Gray um, calculated this mathematically um, actually using um, using a number of existing uh, uh, things they knew about, including the you know, diffusion coefficient of oxygen and the metabolic rate of tumor cells from um, Otto Warburg's work in 1935. Uh, and they were able to calculate, you know, 145 microns, which is right where um, the, the image analysis um, states it to be. So uh, it's really quite amazing work. Uh, and then, uh, so the next thing to talk about, moving on from immunohistochemistry to immunofluorescence. Um, uh, with immunofluorescence, you can start to stain multiple, t multiple different biomarkers at once. Um, and this has the advantage of allowing you to do co-localization analysis, as well as maybe identify particular tissues you might be interested in, and then measure the biomarker of interest within those tissues. So um, uh, this is some work that um, has been done by um, uh, Mark Zaidi, a student of mine, um, where uh, he's looked at a number of different immunostains applied to a tissue section, uh, where we've stained for um, uh, perfusion, a marker of um, blood vessel uh, perfusion, hypoxia, blood vessels, and uh, proliferation. Um, using, again, a machine learning uh, algorithm, we can identify viable tissue away from necrosis and the hypoxic regions. 
Um, and um, we can now um, uh, generate a similar kind of distance relationship from blood vessels, um, but with additional information present in it. Not only do we know where the tumor and the necrosis are, um, we can also find a region um, that's hypoxic, that's where the, the cells are under very low oxygen concentration, and um, those cells are actually quite important from a kind of radiobiological perspective. So um, uh, in addition, we can uh, start to do things like what I call tissue cytometry, it's sort of like flow cytometry, but on the tissue slide. Um, and, and we can generate distance maps and look at um, the relationship of um, these biomarkers versus distance. So for example, hypoxia goes up as you go further away from blood vessels and proliferation goes down. Uh, and this was a recent um, uh, bioarchive, which is uh, now published in the frontier, Frontiers of Bioengineering. Uh, finally, uh, the last um, technique I'll talk about today is imaging mass cytometry. So um, uh, this is where you um, also label with antibodies, but instead of using a fluorophore, um, use a heavy metal um, uh, marker, and that allows you to, uh, with mass with mass spectrometric techniques, um, be able to stain for about 30 or 40 markers at once. Um, it's a highly quantitative readout. Um, however, the disadvantage is, is that there's more complexity with when coming to analyze these images. So um, as mentioned, this is actually something that was developed by a Canadian company, um, DVS Sciences, which, was, uh, which is now Fluidine. Um, and um, uh, the, the heavy metal labeled antibodies are applied to a tissue section, and then um, a pulsed laser is sort of uh, raster scanned across the tissue section um, to generate um, mass peaks that can then be mapped back onto the image, um, which then get, give you kind of a panel of images with very high uh, accuracy very very quantitative um, and so uh, I'll skip over maybe why why is a IMC analysis pipeline important but it's you know uh, important for the same reasons I've discussed before so um, our approach to a generalized kind of IMC analysis pipeline is um, much like with um, bright field images, we first start by inputting the, um, the data. Um, we've actually generated an open source um, converter that will convert um, these proprietary um, text files into an open format, the um, open microscopy environment TIFF format, um, where we can then start to um, take a number of different approaches to analyzing this data. Um, the one that I've worked on more is a sort of a, what I call a computer vision-based approach, where we normalize and combine certain numbers of channels um, and use that to guide a kind of hierarchical tissue and cell segmentation uh, approach. Um, there is also other approaches out there, including a machine learning pixel classifier followed by cell profiler segmentation um, that is also used a lot um, in the literature. Um, following the segmentation, um, you want to do classification, and that can be done um, using either a supervised or an unsupervised approach, um, which I'll, I'll get into a bit later. Um, generating, of course, at the end, numbers and quantitative readouts, and again, um, with the importance of uh, needing uh, quality control and validation. So um, there's a number of different uh, advantages between these two approaches um, that I'll skip over in the interests of time. But um, what we can do um, is, um, well, the other challenge with these images is that how can your eyes see 30 colors at once, right? When you're, when, uh, so uh, one approach is to maybe look at a number of different biomarkers together um, using, using a, a computational approach, we can start to identify kind of um, distinct regions, so your stroma from your tumor, um, from your uh, lumen, uh, and then we can identify the cells and start to quantify um, uh, pixel intensities on a per cell basis within these tissues. Um, this was work done with um, David Headley um, that was published in 2016, um, showing that um, we could measure um, the cisplatin as a, as a chemotherapy um, that gets uh, used in pancreatic cancer, and we could actually measure directly where the cisplatin went within these tumors. And what was interesting is we found that most of the cisplatin actually bound in the stromal regions, not in the tumor regions. So, um, Stepping back to sort of a spatial relationship, um, we still have stroma and tumor in this case. So we can um, generate a distance map, as was mentioned before, and then start to look at um, hypoxia in relation to that distance map. Um, and uh, uh, what we can see is that we can indeed um, 
just as with even a fluorescence, um, we can start to see that we can measure uh, the hypoxia gradient, that as you get further away from the stroma where the blood vessels are, um, you tend to get more um, hypoxia and less proliferation using two different measures of uh, proliferation in this case. Um, however, uh, when we did this with immunofluorescence, we sort of ran out of markers at that stage. There's only so many um, fluorescent spectra you can sort of cram together on one slide. Um, that's not the case in, in, in IMC. I so um, uh, we can now start to really, um, you know, this is kind of a, I call it hypothesis generation. You can start to really tease apart multiple different um, uh, uh, tissues within this context. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, just very briefly on one um, uh, recent project with um, Dr. Jen Gommerman, who's an immunologist in the University of Toronto, uh, where we were looking at um, different uh, multiple sclerosis lesions um, using imaging mass cytometry. So um, the challenge we had was that um, uh, when we tried to, to perform sort of a traditional um, cell segmentation approach um, in these images, uh, we ended up with sort of biological impossible combinations. So um, we would get uh, mixed B and T cells in the same uh, marker, in the same uh, tissue, mostly just because, the, you know, that one uh, T cell that's present here in red um, happens to be right next to a B cell in green, and the markers sort of bleed through into one another. So um, what we decided to do um, uh, was work with them to come up with a biologically guided segmentation approach. Um, that's where we would march through this sort of hierarchy of distinct um, you know, non-overlapping immune subsets and um, identify you know, T cells away from B cells away from other cell types. Um, and then uh, once we had identified these cells, um, we could go in and validate by manually I, manually counting particular cells of particular types. Um, and um, doing this, uh, what we could be able to do is start to tease apart um, these uh, distinct cell types using a kind of uh, scatter plot um, strategy. So this is typically done with um, flow cytometry where you would um, plot these scatter plots and then identify distinct um, uh, populations using a gating approach. Um, and the lines here are the gates that we've set based off of knowing exactly where the cells, where the um, particular cells were um, with this manual approach. And then we could just encode all of that in a, in a, a pandas uh, kind of gating strategy to identify these distinct cell types from one another. Um, uh, in, uh, embedded within the information is also spatial information. So um, within each of these um, tissue sections, there were some blood vessels um, shown in red here, uh, and we could generate a distance map away from the vessels um, shown in green, and then measure where those cells were. So um, the result of all of this work was um, this uh, heat map um, where we could see the difference between kind of normal brain matter and these various distinct um, biologically distinct lesions um, such that uh, we could see that the activated lesions actually had a lot more immune cells invading into the brain um, than the healthy brain. Um, not only that, those immune cells were also a lot closer um, to the to the blood vessels that were present there, um, which was which kind of indicated that the cells were sort of actively effluxing from the um, uh, from the, the blood vessels in those cases. So all of this was um, discussed using kind of a hierarchical, you know, using a supervised um, uh, approach. Again, this sort of, um, uh, you know, generating a scatter plot and setting gates. Um, you can also consider an unsupervised approach where you take all of the information embedded in all of those different, um, uh, you know, those. 20 or 30 different biomarkers and um, uh, let the computer decide, you know, so, so let use um, TSNE dimensionality reduction um, to generate sort of a, a two dimensional plot and then um, use an algorithm called phenograph to just to, to separate those um, individual plot, those individual um, cell types um, by sort of similarity in their marker profiles. That being said, um, we were able to because we had manually labeled a subset of cells, um, we could then use those manual labels to identify, um, you know, which specific biomarkers were present um, within these tissues. So, um, so we've we've also applied this um, in uh, immunofluorescence uh, approach, uh, where um, again we have uh, here we were less. Uh, 
we we felt that the uh, segmentation was doing a fairly good job. Um, so we took a slightly different tact, and what we did was to uh, man again manually label distinct cell types, um, but now just um, uh, uh, look at not only the mean intensity, uh, not only the mean intensity of um, each individual cell, but a number of different sub features. So you know maybe a membrane uh, a nucleus cytoplasm and membrane uh, compartments and the intense, relative intensities of each of those. Um, and then what we could do is actually train a random forest cell classifier um, that could take the existing segmentations as they were, um, but um, start to separate apart um, these cells that we can't really see visually between the two classes, um, but we could separate them you know, mathematically. Um, and uh, we found that this, this classifier tended to do quite well, and this paper is actually currently in revision. So, fingers crossed. Um, uh, but it performed relatively well. Um, finally, um, I've mentioned QC a number of times. So um, uh, quality control is really quite important. And um, this is in particular, um, when you have multiple you know, segmentation strategies, what's the best one to use? Well, um, sometimes that's a little hard to figure out. So um, what we've done is to, um, again, manually label a subset of um, uh, cells in a region. And then um, when we have those manual labels, um, we can then start to compare the manual labels against a number of different um, segmentation approaches. And um, uh, with the goal of really opti you know, optimizing the metric that um, uh, gives us the best result of uh, you know, kind of as many cells as possible with the one-to-one -one correspondence between a, um, between a uh, biomarker and the, um, the segmentation. So uh, hopefully I've explained why uh, computation methods are useful for analysis of this data. Um, one of the reasons is counting cells is tedious and challenging to do accurately, particularly in a multiplex setting. Um, so maybe methods such as this might make high throughput quantification process uh, possible. Um, I've mentioned, of course, the need in immune oncology for a multi-marker approach, um, uh, that these tissue level assessments can give you spatial relationships. Uh, and then finally, quality control um, is critical to being able to uh, do uh, the type of work that's that's necessary here. So um, uh, we've actually this. So uh, in addition to all of this work that's happened at Star, um, um, I've uh, connected up with a number of different experts across the world um, that are also interested in. Uh, multiplex the challenges associated with multiplex staining, and um, we actually we're uh, uh, we ha I'm a topic editor on Frontiers. So if anyone is working on um, uh, approaches such as these, I would um, suggest that you submit an article to this um, call for articles. Um, deadline is end of January, um, where we're trying to really you know try and see what can we do to try and push uh, immunofluorescence from sort of a research um, into into real clinical use and clinical acceptance. Um, and uh, in amongst these discussions, we've sort of come up with, you know, challenges to overcome in the next 10 years on multiplex analysis. Um, that includes kind of, you know, perfecting cell uh, segmentation, um, kind of maybe cell segmenting by feature. Um, uh, of course, for QC, you know, how good is good? You know, uh, uh, perfect is a dangerous word, uh, and how good is kind of good enough to be able to continue with your work. Um, visualization, there's just so many things you can do with multiple markers present in one tissue section. And um, the goal eventually would be integration of this these sorts of data types with um, human cell atlas and other sorts of uh, uh, online uh, open source repositories that, that are happening. Um, and so that brings me to my last point, which is, you know, kind of uh, thinking about open source innovation, maybe some novel considerations. So, uh, so oh, uh, hopefully uh, I have one more thing and then I'll stop. Um, so, you know, maybe traditionally um, you might think that, you know, you would patent some intellectual property and then use that patent to commercialize. Um, and maybe that's not as applicable in kind of an open source world. So, um, you know, uh, I've been sort of trying to think about what about sort of a hybrid approach because there's a number of open source repositories of um, algorithms that are available. Uh, maybe you can combine, you know, the um, 
the goals of the open source movement, along with maybe innovation in, in a service delivery model to try and provide these tools to customers in the open framework. Um, and that's kind of some of the thinking behind Pathomics. So um, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're, my goal is to try and make Pathomics kind of a repository of information and resources um, around computational pathology. Um, and then come maybe combine that with an analysis uh, service um, provision that we provide to customers. So um, it's still very much in development. Um, please email me if you'd like to uh, kind of contribute to this effort, uh, where we can you know start to break down uh, the landscape of computational pathology into the various um, sub compartments, and um, and really the goal is to you know come up with something that's both easy to use and able to handle complex analysis. So at Star we've um, been lucky to be able to use a number of different commercial solutions that are available, um, but um, you know maybe the thinking is uh, maybe if we can take all of the lessons learned from all of these commercial products to try and build maybe a web-based easy to use toolkit that can integrate you know modern machine and deep learning along with data visualization and, and interrogation and try to move um, you know kind of up this uh, in this angle in terms of being able to handle increase, increasing amounts of complex analysis as well as making it easy to use um, for, for uh, people that would be interested so um, with that um, I'll, I'll just end with um, saying that you know our goal isn't necessarily to to um, replace pathologists but um, really that the combination of pathology and image analysis is the best of both worlds so um, you know you can combine the strengths of a pathologist with um, the strengths of let's say counting with an algorithm um, and and this has been shown uh, that the top you know uh, path the top eight Pathologist still outperforms the top AI system, but working together, um, they can really do a lot better. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you and, uh, and take questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McKee. A very nice presentation. Actually, this field has been uh, in my radar for, for a while. I'm, not, I'm no expert in uh, in AI and image processing, but uh, some of the work that we do here is uh, highly relevant to uh, to what you're doing. Uh, uh, and then it was very interesting to see how uh, how much advancement you have made in in, in that field. Uh, a lot of work can be done. Uh, uh, and uh, but before we start uh, to ask questions. Uh, would like to let you take a break and then I'll explain a little bit about um, uh, our next speaker. We will have uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Adam Feinberg, uh, Feinberg from uh, the uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He will be talking about fresh 3D uh, bioprinting. Uh, uh, so uh, please mark your calendars and make sure that you participate in his talk. Um, it's going to be very interesting to to hear his talk. Also, uh, I would like to thank our uh, sponsors, uh, Montreal Transmed Tech and Stem Cell Technologies. Uh, without their support, without the support that we receive from our sponsors, we are not able to run these meetings. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so. Uh, for those of you who may have questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, uh, there are a few questions posted uh, on the Q&A box, and then there are a few questions posted on my uh, notebook or on my paper. So uh, I'll start with uh, the question from uh, from the participants, uh, Kai Wen. Uh, who uh, the question is for deep neural network in detecting plasma cells in multiple uh, myelo myeloma how, myeloma how would you deal with uh, the difference in staining colors across different slides no that's a that's a great question um, and I think you know, potentially we've been avoiding that issue so far by by working on a data set that's coming all from one institution stained in the same lab. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think you have to start somewhere. And, and we felt that that was a reasonable place to start because at least within um, within our hospital, um, all of the tissues would go through that same lab for processing. Um, 
but um, stain normalization is um, is quite an important field in itself. Uh, and um, you know, I think um, there's a number of potential ways to deal with it, including um, you know maybe uh, as you as you extend the um, algorithm from from the initial training data set towards additional data sets, you would want to make sure that. Um, either you incorporate some way of, of taking a new data set that been, that's been stained somewhere else that might look different and, um, you know, uh, training it to look more like the ones that you've already seen um, is one approach. And then the other approach is to uh, make sure that you, you, you um, receive training data from that new um, uh, data set um, that, that you feed into the algorithm. You know, the advantage of a deep learning algorithm is that um, the more data you feed it, the more, um, you know, the, the, the better uh, potentially it's going to perform. So, um, uh, but that's absolutely one of the, ch one of the big concerns around um, deep learning is overfitting, overfitting to a narrow use case when there's other data that might be outside of that use case. Um, and it is something to, again, have QC uh, and uh, have a QC approach and a validation approach to um, to ensuring that um, that you're you're working within the confines of what's possible. Wonderful. So it's uh, so I have a few follow up questions, uh, uh, which uh, which are very uh, which I had in my mind for a long time. Uh, yeah. So you talked about two things. One is um, the number of images that you need to make sure that your algorithm is well trained, right? I mean, yeah. But, yeah. but what is that number? How many images is uh, is good? I mean, just a ballpark. Not I don't yeah. know the exact number, but what, what is about? Is it like a few thousands? Is it a few hundred? Is it like a, a million? And how many is is, is that, good? That's a, that's a good question. That's actually a question <laughs> I asked um, Jeff Hinton several years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I'd have to remember think of what how he answered it, but I think it was dep it depends on what the question is that you're asking. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think there there is no. I mean, I think he said as many as you can give me. Yeah. Was the answer right. So uh, the more the better. Um, and again, it comes back to overfitting. You know, yeah. um, uh, you can certainly train on a handful of images, um, mm -hmm. but uh, in the initial, in when you whatever you train off of those handful of images yeah. is likely not going to perform well. Um, you know, um, outside of that very small confine. Okay. Um, and um, I mean, that's that's where um, data augmentation strategies are used. So sometimes, you know, when, you, when you're training these networks, you're not only training it just on those, whatever, 50 or 100 samples, you're also taking those 50 samples and you're rotating them 50 degrees yeah. and rotating this way and stretching them a little bit, and yeah. you know, in order to boost up the amount of effective um, information you have to train the system. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Because we were trying to uh, train an algorithm for our, um, I mean, technology that we are developing, and then we had around, I think, five thousand images in different conditions, and then we still got, you know, overfitting. So it's it's a you need a lot of data. That's, that's you, yeah. yeah. The, the more the better. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, I think the 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 what can I say? We 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 did about the multiple. Myeloma was maybe about ten thousand cells wow. that were counted in each case, you know, yeah. um, uh, which which came from a, f a couple hundred images, maybe, yeah. um, you know, and 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 so it, it also depends, right? When when you're counting cells versus yeah. classifying regions of tissue, um, yeah. you know, there's different um, considerations there as well. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. I have a question about that, but before we get to that question. Uh, my other question is about the validation. You mentioned also that validation and QC is um, is is very important, and I agree with you uh, on that. And then you mentioned that one of the um, uh, in one of your slides, you compared your results with uh, you know uh, with manual counting of yeah. cells. Uh, so, and that's one way of uh, validation. Uh, what are the other endpoints, clinical endpoints that you can you can use to to validate your uh, your algorithm. Great question, and I mean, I think this is this is something where um, where AI has the potential to really, um, you know, potentially do better than what we can do currently. Right? Currently, what happens is that pathologists have this, you know, amazing kind of repository of um, different sort of 
pattern recognition embedded in their brains that tells them, you know, this is normal and this is abnormal, right? And um, but um, can a pathologist necessarily look at a, a biopsy from a patient and be able to say, well, that patient is going to need this therapy five years from now? Not necessarily, right? Because they don't have all of that information. That comes from these big retrospective studies, and and that's where, you know, outcome really. I mean, what's the goal at the end of the day, the goal is better outcomes for patients. And, and so as much as we can start to accumulate, um, uh, you know, I think I didn't really mention it, but um, data repositories are massively useful. So one of the one of our clients actually is HistoWiz. Um, and they have kind of the biggest online database of pathology images, um, I think, you know, uh, out there. And they perform the pathology as a service um, for people, but then they allow you to kind of put it within their massive online database. And then um, that, you know, that's a great resource for training data that can help you to um, start to start to answer these sorts of questions. So. Wonderful. And that uh, resource, is, is it is it uh, open, act, like open to, to everyone or this is you need to? Um, for HistoWiz, they um, like you can sign up for their pathology map and and get access to it oh, and certainly if you do any staining with them it's it's all stored there um uh the uh, there are other open re repositories as well i mean the the chameleon um challenge is one example so that's um, mm -hmm. jerome van der Laak, who's in um the netherlands and he um, he's put up a number of these, um, uh, you know, annotated uh, images as just a challenge and say, hey, you yeah. know, who can who can build algorithms for this? And yeah. I think we frankly need more of those to be able to push Exactly. That. Exactly. I agree with you. Because uh, for all of us to be able to tackle challenges with treating, let's say, cancer, which is, uh, which is a, a big challenge for everyone, globally uh, is, is to like uh, you know work together and uh, yeah. maybe uh, and I really I mean I mean I really like your last slide and one of the last slides that you talked about this open uh, source algorithms and even and even if that's possibility because I understand that uh, many of the researchers and then even companies they spend a lot of money and then they invest on collecting tissues and that's mm -hmm. a, that's a lot of investment and and uh, you know giving it up to everyone is not that easy i understand it but it would yeah. be great that if if like we form a you know a collaborative network collaborative. exactly absolutely. absolutely you know i think i mean i, I well, I spoke mostly about like open source from an algorithmic perspective, but open source data is really is what's going to push us forward in the next in the next twenty years. Exactly, exactly, and there should be uh, initiatives to support this. Again, those yeah. who spend a lot of money and time and on developing or, or uh, generating this data, they should be somehow supported. Yeah. But another another thing quickly to mention is that there is an Ontario Molecular Pathology Research Network. Um, and um, uh, they've actually just just had a granting um, uh, uh, thing for um, image analysis, and so mm -hmm. uh, and I think part of that is ensuring that you know the image analysis that gets performed is is also available to other researchers. So, that, that, that's fantastic. That's fantastic, and I'm glad to hear this because uh, we researchers tend to you know keep everything to ourselves but it's good to open up and then just share the the ideas and uh and, and it's great um uh, uh so let me just ask a question from from chris flores uh, uh, chris is from 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 our university uvic he is our industrial liaison and then he is also uh, the digital super cluster uh, representative uh, so uh, his question is about uh, whether uh, uh, Star participates in supercluster projects, for example, for example, digital technology supercluster uh, projects, or if you are interested in other collaborations. I, I would I would be be very interested in collaborating. I believe um, I believe um, our hospital university. Health network might already be a part of the digital supercluster um but um that i think that might be a bit more on the um on the sort of uh, uh clinical side um but i i'd be more than happy to investigate ways of, of collaborating i'm i'm 
you know, I, I, I like I like uh, working with people. Absolutely. I'll put you guys in touch. Uh, so, <laughs> so I have another challenging question. Again, I mean, it might be challenging for me. It's it's a piece of cake for you, but uh, <laughs> I was always thinking about this this pre- like sample tissue preparations, right? It's I mean the way yeah. we prepare samples is is very important, right? Yes, uh, and I mean that. Partic- particularly with multiplex, right? So yeah. uh, with with single color, at least you can sort of tweak your, your antigen retrieval this way and that way. But when you're staining 30 colors at once, yeah. you got to have one, you know, one antigen retrieval step for everything. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So towards that open access concept that I had and that you and I agreed upon, mm-hmm. is, are you thinking about, you know, providing... Uh, universal protocol again uh, a mm. protocol can be uni i mean i mean uh, i mean although we have protocols i mean you need you still need some techniques uh, i mean i mean to yeah. do uh, these tests but are you planning to have such a protocol that at least if someone like me let's say you send it to mm. my lab and then this protocol and i have some tissues and i stain it and i don't get uh, like a, a like a good quality image as you guys get with with uh, with, yeah. with your systems uh, uh, do, yeah, are you yeah. planning to provide such facility or such, you know, protocols for for us or for other researchers? That's, that's a very good question, um, and and there's multiple potential layers there. Um, but maybe I'll start out with one one that I do know exists is um, part of this kind of international consortium on multiplex. Uh, yeah. I know um, there is a strong effort, particularly I mean. What each lab, each lab can do their own thing on a preclinical basis. That's fine. But when we start to getting to, you know, when we're dealing with patient samples and when, you know, you might potentially be making, um, you know, clinical decision making based off of um, patient, you know, uh, immune uh, staining, immunostaining samples, that's a different consideration, right? So um, along those lines, I know that uh, there is a... Um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but there there is a consortium of uh, groups, I think through the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, um, that is focused on exactly that. On um, We're gonna send you kind of cell pellets of defined um, mix, mixtures of immune cells um, around, well, like we're, we're gonna prepare all of these pellets, we're gonna ship them to everybody. Um, you're all gonna stain them on your individual uh, uh, stains, uh, on, on your individual whatever, technologies um, and then you submit the results that you get from that that from that staining back to the kind of central lab and then um and then it's it's almost blinded in a way that you don't know what the true answer is and then um and then that's kind of a you know a a validation of um, of of how good each of these labs is right which is a difficult question to ask because there's so many considerations, but I think it's a necessary thing to do, you know? So, so you can think of something like even a tonsil, like there's lots of tonsil material around in, in different hospitals and even building in um, staining. And that, that does happen again, also at the, at the clinical level. Um, uh, Dr. Carol Chung um, is, is a part of uh, university of UHN's um, pathology group. And um, she tries to make sure that when you're doing immunostaining, that there's a, a small little panel of like cores that are again just common tissues like a piece of liver, a piece of uh, tonsil, a piece of this, a piece of that, on each of the slides that gets stained, um, right? That's used for clinical, um, and then and then that way that provides you a little built-in check of like is the yeah. staining actually working? You know, um, I think it's these like I I mean I'd love to do everything, but <laughs> um, no, but I think. There needs to be a lot of these sorts of validation and QC in addition to the protocols, right? The protocols are one thing, um, but um, even the the even from a algorithmic standpoint, there's there's validation that you need to do, and maybe if there's common positive t- positive control tissues that are being stained, um, a way of kind of incorporating that information in in a, in a robust manner. Okay, that's 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 very good. Uh, again, I mean, I mean, AI has recently. I mean, AI has been out there for a while, but it has been recently, you know, used for for clinical and medical applications. And then we still have uh, uh, we still have plenty of uh, work to do. Uh, 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 but my question is about uh, 
your vision. So when do you think that this uh, technology, AI, can be used in, 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 in labs or diagnostic application, or is it has it been used already, or uh, maybe I'm there are it? there's already a few approvals, right? So mm -hmm. so there's a couple um, there's a couple companies that are really quite far along this path, um, mm -hmm. including Path AI, Page AI, um, Deep Lens. There's there's a few others, and um, they're they're all marching very much along the um, path towards. I think I mean it even starts with FDA FDA clearance. For the monitor that the pathologist uses when they're doing the diagnosis, right? Um, you've 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 got to go all the way all the way back to you know making sure that the colors are correct, um, you know, and reproducible. Um, uh, and I mean, as of as of a few years ago, pathologists um, could only make a diagnosis in the U.S. based on an actual glass slide that they looked at through a microscope. And just with Philips was the first one to get. Um, FDA approval for mm -hmm. a digital version of that. So I would say, you know, sort of in pathology, we're maybe a, a bit behind what's been happening in radiology, which has always been a bit more kind of along the technical development. But um, uh, I think uh, we are definitely, we're heading in that direction. Uh, we're heading in the direction of, of getting, F, you know, of, of getting FDA approved um, algorithms that are going to be used. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, um, uh, being, being the eternal skeptic that I am, um, I think, you know, like key to that approval is uh, making sure that the um, the regulate, you know, that that the that the validation and, and making sure that that algorithm doesn't sort of veer off towards kind of, you know, um, overcounting in certain cases yeah. um, is is needs to be there, right? There needs yeah. to be a um, uh, process in place for handling um, yeah. deviations. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that totally makes sense. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, but you answered my my other question about your, uh, uh, I mean, the position of FDA and like regulatory bodies. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, and this, and then it's, I'm glad that uh, I see that uh, eventually these regulatory uh, bodies are like you know, uh, the slowly. Thing is that getting, they're, they're, they're acknowledging the existence, yeah. right? So there has been innovations at the FDA in yeah. terms of making, even making a path for AI algorithms to, yeah. to go through um, that wasn't there before. So, that's, um, yeah. That's very good. That's good. I want to, I want to, I have questions, but I want to let Human ask uh, questions if he, if he has any. I just, uh, yeah. I just have a follow-up question because you, you talk about your vision maybe in 50 years, and AI and ML is very, uh, I mean, are uh, very scary, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so maybe in 50 years, how these technologies will impact the, the, the work by radiologists, pathologists, and do we really, like, need them, uh, I mean, or any other, I mean, many other uh, professions in, in the world right. that can be impacted by these technologies? That can be impacted, absolutely. Um, my my answer to that question um, is um, did um, you know uh, so radiologists right before there were CT machines there were film right they were looking at film and making diagnosis did the CT machine replace the radiologist no the radiologist went from looking at a two D you know projection um, to a three D slice and um, adapted to what they were doing uh, where they maybe didn't need to have as many you know they didn't. It, it, things became clearer, right? With the advances in technology, things became clearer, and um, you know maybe the the type of work that they were doing um, shifted. Um, so I would say, you know, um, uh, I, I wouldn't be on, I wouldn't be marching on the bandwagon of like, you know, uh, pathologists are going to be irrelevant. You know, pathologists are like there. There are always. Um, important clinical decisions that need to be made um, that pathologists will participate in. And in, in fact, in many ways, pathologists really integrate all of the information coming from, you know, the patient's therapy and everything else. It's not just the pattern recognition is only one part of what the pathologist does. Um, and so, you know, that part isn't necessarily going to go away. The interaction with the patient isn't necessarily going to go away. Um, but, you know, maybe again, 
Um, does a pathologist have to sit there and count a hundred brown cells um, when they could be, you know, doing other things with their time? Um, uh, so I think that's that's my perspective on it, at least. Um, is, is maybe a tech. I'm a technological optimist in certain ways, and um, I think that um, these technologies aren't necessarily going to. It might change the type of job that you do, but it's not going to, you know, replace. There's always jobs to do, and there's always important. And maybe some of the boring stuff is is something that could be handled by a machine. So. Thank you so much, Mohsen. I don't have any other questions. Uh, there are questions well, in you. the Q and A box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, one question is from uh, Mohsen, but th this is not me. Uh, <laughs> That's another motion. <laughs> so uh, the question is about the cost uh, of, of uh, AI. First of all, uh, how expensive it is uh, to uh, run such an algorithm? And if this is, uh, uh, and then what is, what is the, uh, like, uh, what is the lowest cost for analyzing uh, images? Uh, That's a good question for for cost so i mean there are commercial softwares as i mentioned that are available mm -hmm. um but uh it, it really you don't you're not forced to use those right um i mean another um tremendous advantage of the open source movement is the development of things like python and um, tensorflow and pytorch and all of these methodologies that are there and are free and you can install on your computer and you know, if you get a reasonably decent, you know, even gaming graphics card, you can uh, train a deep neural net, and you know, already just in your house. So, um, uh, you know, I think um, I'm less concerned, maybe, about the cost of the of, of actually running a neural network. Um, you know, I mean, certainly at, at large scales, those, that becomes a factor when you're trying to do thousands of things and on you know on an on aws or, or these sorts of things that is a challenge um but um you know kind of at the at the local scale there's there's still a lot that could be done um, um to at least uh develop some of these methodologies um the, the i mean there's some there's an ear there's a there's a cost you can't get away from which is the cost of staining um and scanning the images but um but i mean there, there already exists uh thousands and thousands of these images that are available in hospitals that we can potentially um, take advantage of. Um, you know, again, if we if we can try to move towards open source uh, data sharing. So. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, a very good sure. point, sorry, uh, Dr. McKee. And then um, it's about the cost of uh, uh, reagents and materials. Uh, so do you hmm. see microfluidics playing any role in reducing the cost of uh, reagents and uh, would that be useful for uh, maybe maybe these kinds of analysis yes um, yeah I, I could certainly there's certainly a lot of room for innovation in um, the use of that of microfluidics um, particularly when it comes to maybe you know I mean antibodies are expensive and um, uh, uh, for for scaling up, you know, a staining um, uh, rather than sort of, you know, dipping in a whole bath of antibody or, or pipetting an antibody onto a onto a uh, uh, image versus kind of flow using microfluidics to flow over. Um, there's a lot of room there, and I think there are actually even uh, companies that are doing this. So. Um, uh, uh, Kodak, uh, Koya uh, makes the Kodak system, and I think that already has built into it some mm -hmm. some uh, microfluidic uh, methods for um, layering antibodies on and then washing them off. So, mm. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, uh, there, there is only one last question. Uh, I hope you have time to. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, so the last question is from uh, from Mariam, and then. Uh, she is asking whether you uh, you used fluorescent nanomaterials for cellular imaging. Have you? I I have in the past. So part of my PhD work, we did um, some quantum dots, uh, some quantum dot labeled um, yeah. uh, nanoparticles of different sizes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then I mean I guess you could consider 
the um, the fluid ion um, kind of antibodies with the polymer conjugated to the heavy metal as being a you know a, a, as being a nanoparticle as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, 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 there are no more questions. I also uh, uh, do not have uh, any questions. Uh, so I think I think uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, again our uh, speaker, uh, Dr. McKee, an amazing talk uh, you gave today. Uh, it was very inspiring for, for me, at least. And, and I learned a lot uh, from you today. And then you made me think more about, about the potential uses of uh, AI and image processing, even in some of the work that we do. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I uh, also would like to thank all the participants for, uh, uh, for attending this uh, these seminar series. Uh, uh, don't forget, our next speaker is going to be uh, Professor Adam Feinberg from the Carl Gimenon University. Uh, he will be talking about uh, fresh 3D bioprinting. So if you are a big fan of bioprinting technologies, don't miss that, uh, uh, that talk. So with that, I would like to end our uh, 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 session today and then wish you all a good day or night if you're on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye.